As part of my look at global militaries, I had long planned to do a video on the Israeli Defence Force. Militaries tend to be shaped by their threat environment, political and economic contexts. And so far as contexts go, the Middle East of the 20th and 21st century is about as complex as it gets, making the IDF from a force design and defence economics perspective a particularly interesting military to study. On the 7th of October, however, those questions became significantly less academic when Hamas launched a series of attacks from the Gaza Strip into Israeli territory, causing Israel to call up its reserves and declare war on Hamas in response. It's a pressing and tragic context that I think makes understanding Israeli defence strategy and the IDF more important than ever. And so today, as the world braces for further potential escalations, that's the topic I'm going to try and tackle. To do that, I'll start, as I often do, with a little bit of history, talking about some of the major engagements fought by the IDF. Then we'll look at Israel's strategic position and what the modern IDF looks like, both in terms of personnel and equipment on one hand and doctrine and thinking on the other. That'll include a look at two relatively unique elements of Israel's defence strategy, namely its relatively comprehensive system of conscription and mobilisation, as well as the policy of nuclear ambiguity. We'll then pivot to Israel's strategic international relationships and also its defence industrial base because this is a country which, despite its comparatively small size in population terms, does invest a lot of effort in being a significant arms manufacturer and exporter. Finally, I will take a brief look at recent events, but mostly from the standpoint of trying to make some militarily relevant observations and try to at least ask the question of what may happen next. That leaves me with a very important caveat to make, but before we go to it, quick word from a sponsor. And today I'm welcoming back a returning sponsor and my personal VPN of choice, Private Internet Access. I've talked a lot on this channel about how transparent modern battlefields can be, how difficult technology can sometimes make it to conceal movements or protect critical information. And while the internet is usually a much less hostile environment than most battlefields, concerns about transparency and privacy in the online environment can be very real. Even a casual Google search will show that data and privacy breaches aren't exactly uncommon. And that's before you account for the fact that in 2023, one of the most popular passwords in the world is still a password. There's no single solution to protecting your privacy online, but I think a VPN can help. With just one or two clicks, a VPN can conceal your IP address, reroute your internet traffic, and help protect your privacy, especially on public networks. And as for protecting data like your traffic logs, as a general principle, it's pretty hard to compromise data that doesn't exist. And private internet access are pretty clear that they have a no-logs policy that has been tested in court and subject to audit. Their VPN is compatible with a range of streaming services and available across multiple platforms, which matters because a single subscription allows protection for an unlimited number of devices. And then to connect those devices to VPN servers in 84 different countries or 50 different US states. So if you're interested in this VPN, which is the one I've been using for a while now, you can go ahead and check out the link that will be in the description. That'll give you access to an 83% discount off a two year subscription plus four bonus months, covering an unlimited number of devices and with the protection of a 30 day money back guarantee. So as I said, first a caveat about what this video is and what it isn't. Like my previous videos on Japanese, Korean, Turkish, or French defense strategy, this is a video about a national military, its capabilities, and the strategy and economic structures that sit behind it. What it isn't is a deep dive into the history and politics of the region. Questions of international law, territory, settlements, insurrections, terrorism, and the long history of Israeli-Palestinian relations. That isn't because I don't think those issues are critically important. They are. But there are millions of voices discussing those topics, and if there's an area where I think I might be able to add some value and context to the wider conversation, it's defence economics and national strategy, not those other very important questions. So please, I ask, take this analysis for what it is, keep things civil in the comments, and where an issue isn't covered, please don't read silence as apathy. Now with that said, let's get into it. Starting as we often do with a bit of military history to help us understand how the IDF became the kind of force that it is today. Geographically speaking, a significant portion of the population occupies a relatively narrow strip of land up against the Mediterranean. To the north, Israel borders Syria and Lebanon. To the east, the Palestinian territories in the West Bank and Jordan. While to the southwest, there is both the Gaza Strip and the nation of Egypt. Not visible on this map, but deeply significant for contemporary Israeli military thinking, is the Islamic Republic of Iran, much further to the east. Iran and Israel don't share a land border, but it's generally understood that Iran exercises influence or control over a number of forces in the region. That includes, for example, Iranian operations and influence in Syria, Hezbollah in Lebanon, or Hamas in Gaza. From 1920 to 1948, political and military authority in what was then mandatory Palestine was exercised by the United Kingdom. 
In 1947, the United Nations passed a partition plan for the territories covered by the British Mandate. The partition provided for both Jewish and Arab states, as well as a special arrangement for the city of Jerusalem. And then, in May 1948, the British Mandate ended. And to what I'm sure is the great surprise of all of you listening, the process of drawing some partition lines on a map and then relatively rapidly withdrawing the colonial policing force did not in fact lead to an immediate period of regional peace and prosperity. Fighting had in fact been ongoing even before the British withdrawal, but would only escalate afterwards. The day before the British mandate expired, Israel declared its independence, with both the United States and Soviet Union quickly recognising it. Many of the surrounding nations, however, did not, and in relatively short order, Israel found itself fighting a war against forces from Egypt, Iraq, Transjordan, Syria, as well as volunteers from Saudi Arabia, Lebanon and Yemen. In terms of the balance of available population and resources, The war in 1948 was probably Israel's most difficult. There were some high-quality opposing forces, particularly the British-trained Arab Legion from Jordan, while the IDF itself was basically built over the course of the war. Various pre-existing paramilitary forces were merged into the newly created Israeli Defence Force, while mobilisation efforts were extensive. In some cases, arriving immigrants were mobilised almost immediately. And while the regular military was essentially being built on the go, remember this is 1948 and so there were more than a few personnel available, particularly from the pool of foreign volunteers who had significant World War II experience. The State of Israel survived the war, but only through significant mobilisation, extensive casualties, and some of the strangest military logistics ever seen. Looking at the equipment used in the air war highlights just how bizarre the overall situation was. Especially early on, one of Israel's most important weapon suppliers was then-communist Czechoslovakia. Remember, the USSR had recognised Israeli independence, and Czechoslovakia was both very long on surplus World War II era weapons and short on hard currency. Among other things, Prague provided a number of Avia S-199 fighters. This was a Czech derivative of none other than the German World War II Messerschmitt Bf-109G. They would be opposed in the air by aircraft including Egyptian Spitfires from Britain, meaning that only about three years after the end of World War II, you might have a situation where... A Jewish-American veteran of World War II was flying a German-designed fighter supplied by communists against a force operating British-built Spitfires. Because this is the Middle East and it's complicated is just the natural state of being. The IDF fought another major action in 1956, this time in de facto alliance with the UK and France. For France and the UK, this was an attempt to reclaim control of the Suez Canal after Egypt had nationalised it. Whereas Israel saw an opportunity to reopen the Straits of Tehran, which had been closed to Israeli shipping, and to improve its overall strategic position. Militarily, the Israeli campaign was a complete success. Through a combination of the aggressive employment of paratroopers and rapid advances by armour and infantry forces, Israel essentially seized both the Sinai Peninsula and the Gaza Strip in relatively short order for relatively few losses. Politically, however, things didn't go quite so well. Both the United States and the Soviet Union came out against the Anglo-French action. And remember, this is 1956. So if both Moscow and Washington oppose the same action, congratulations, because A, you have stuffed up massively, and B, it's probably just game over. The squeeze was placed on both the British and French economies, forcing them to withdraw, and Israel, which, at this point, was a much poorer nation than either France or Britain, also had to give up the territories it had taken. Although the war did result in a UN force being placed in Gaza and the Sinai, which for a time at least created a kind of buffer between Israel and Egypt. That was the case at least until May 19, 1967, when the Egyptian president Nasser expelled the UN forces and took over many of their former positions. A few days later, he announced that Egypt would be closing the Straits of Tehran to Israel. The Straits are Israel's only southern maritime route. One of the motivations for war in 1956 had been to reopen these straits, and about 90% of Israel's oil, at that time being brought in primarily from then-friendly Iran, travelled through that maritime link. In the days that followed, Jordan and Egypt would sign a military treaty, while Iraqi and Egyptian troops would begin arriving in Jordan. On paper, this alliance massively outnumbered the Israeli defenders, not just in terms of personnel, but also in terms of things like tanks and aircraft. But on the 5th of June 1967, they would be caught almost completely off guard when the Israeli Air Force began attacking Egyptian airfields. This was Operation Focus, and it was to be the opening act of what in English-speaking countries is commonly known as the Six-Day War. In purely military terms, the IDF's conduct of the Six-Day War was dramatic and effective. 
Despite being significantly outnumbered, the Israeli Air Force destroyed most opposing aircraft on the ground during the first day of operations. Israeli ground crews and pilots tolerated incredibly short turnaround windows, wherein an aircraft could land, be refueled, rearmed, and back in the air within eight minutes, meaning that many Israeli pilots would fly two sorties against Egyptian targets and another against Syrian and Jordanian targets all within the first day. Now, I know Formula One pit crews are pretty damn good at their job, but they're usually not asked to handle runway cratering munitions while trying to set a speed record. The resulting damage, particularly to the Egyptian Air Force, was catastrophic. Before Operation Focus, Egypt had possessed 30 heavy Tupolev-16 bombers, each of which could potentially have delivered tons of high explosives against Israeli urban or military targets. By the end of Operation Focus, none were operational. On the ground, the fighting was often much more contested, but ultimately, extremely decisive. Israel ended the main combat phase of the 1967 war with a massive amount of additional territory under its control. It had occupied the Gaza Strip and the Sinai Peninsula, setting the stage for a war of attrition across the canal with Egyptian forces. To the northeast, Israel had taken the strategically significant Golan Heights from Syria, helping to secure both critical high ground and also its water supply. Meanwhile, the Israelis had also pushed the Jordanians out of the West Bank and captured East Jerusalem. Israel would finally withdraw from the Sinai in 1982 and from Gaza in 2005. For what are probably pretty obvious reasons, many military academies will still include the Six-Day War in their curriculum. But at the time, the war seems to have taught the IDF a number of lessons, some potentially useful and others erroneous. The IDF, for example, recognised that air power had played a decisive role, while the Israeli commander, Moshe Dayan, observed that Israel's opponents hadn't appreciated the advantage that came from striking first. If that was the case, it does seem to have been a lesson that was subsequently learned, because in the October of 1973, a new coalition led by Egypt and Syria did exactly that, launching a surprise attack against the Israelis on the 10th day of Ramadan and the Jewish holiday of Yom Kippur. The IDF was caught flat-footed, suffered a number of reverses, and despite the situation stabilising once Israel was able to mobilise its reserves and American resupply began to arrive, the war was still very costly for an IDF that remembered the experience of 1967. Israeli military casualties, dead, wounded and captured, were probably north of 10,000. 400 Israeli tanks had been destroyed, a further 660 plus damaged or captured, and the Israeli Air Force had lost more than 100 valuable aircraft all over the course of a war that lasted only a little over two weeks. Losses for the opposing coalition were significantly higher, but with the major demographic disparities in play and the Soviet Union acting as a critical arms supplier, the ability of both sides to sustain and regenerate from losses wasn't exactly symmetrical. The IDF took a number of lessons learned from the 1973 war, as too, it must be said, did foreign militaries, including that of the United States but it also marked something of a turning point for the IDF and the wars it would be required to fight. For the first 40 years of its existence, the modern state of Israel fought at least one major interstate war every decade. What's more, it had had to fight at least some of them against opponents that, on paper at least, had significantly more available resources. That had demanded a powerful conventional military that could rapidly mobilise and quickly win conventional conflicts. But as the 1980s came around, the situation was clearly changing. Egypt and Israel normalised relations, and the IDF became increasingly focused not on conventional war fighting, but on military duties that were instead often ugly, asymmetric, and enduring. There would be a number of major operations in places like Gaza and Lebanon, but most didn't come close to approaching the scale of what had been seen in the 60s or 70s. Which brings us to a discussion of Israel's strategic position as it stands today, and how, just as for other nations we've looked at, like Korea or Japan, geographical and political realities help shape Israeli investment and force design decisions. For Israel, I think there are three elements that bear special mention. The first, as we've already discussed, is having multiple land borders. And as you may have figured out from the number of all-out wars we covered in the history section, those land borders are not with an abundant supply of natural allies. That helps differentiate Israel's strategic position from that of some other small nations like the Czech Republic or Austria. The second key factor is in terms of natural resources, Israel's actually pretty poor. The former Prime Minister of Israel, Golda Meir, is reported to have once joked about this by saying, quote, let me tell you something that we Israelis have against Moses. He took us 40 years through the desert in order to bring us to the one spot in the Middle East that has no oil, end quote. But at a basic level, you can argue it's actually worse than just not having the resources to become a wealthy petrostate. 
Israel's pretty short, even on fundamentals like drinking water. Israel is highly reliant both on water recycling and also desalination, meaning that energy resources have to be imported to convert seawater into drinking water. I've heard it said before about some water-poor Middle Eastern states that in the end you can't drink oil. That, of course, is very, very true if you value your health, but in a sense, Israel very much does drink coal and gas. Now, that's obviously not a great strategic starting position for a nation, but in terms of shaping Israeli military thinking, the third factor is arguably much more important, and that is Israel's almost complete lack of what is commonly called strategic depth. Many nations have at least some distance between their major population and industrial centres and potential opponents. Drive 400 kilometres west of Moscow, for example, towards the nearest border, that with Belarus, and you'll only have made it to Smolensk, not even to the Belarusian border. Israel's strategic buffer, by contrast, has about as much depth as your average Fast and Furious storyline. To give a sense of scale, the Ukrainian breach into the Surovikin line on the Arikiv axis that we talked about last week, that's very roughly 10 kilometres at its deepest extent, and that's only barely enough to break Ukrainian offensive units into one of the main belts of Surovikin line defences. Beyond that would be more defences, the city of Tokmak, and then a long run to the coast. When you're talking about Israel, 10 kilometres gets you essentially from the Gaza border most of the way to Ashkelon, a nearby city in Israel with a population of approximately 150,000. Whereas in Ukraine, 10 kilometres might be an operational prelude. As recent events show, in Israel it can be a catastrophe. Zoom out a little bit more, and if you start at the Jordanian border, it's only about 70 kilometres to Haifa on the coast. That's about 43 miles, and in many cities around the world, isn't far enough to go from one side of the city to the other. That lack of strategic depth means Israeli military planners have always been aware of the fact that it would never take much for one or two defensive defeats to become a total defeat, because there simply isn't much Israel to retreat into. In the process of defeating Napoleon's invading army, Russian imperial forces retreated hundreds of miles into the interior, even temporarily abandoning Moscow. An Israeli military making a similar retreat would find itself defending positions in the Mediterranean Sea far to the west of Cyprus. So for Israel, the gap between partial and total defeat is considerably narrower than it is for many other nations. At the same time, it's likely to lack the population and resources necessary to inflict any kind of permanent decisive defeat on all of its neighbours. Even in the absolute headiest days of 1967, immediately after the victory in the Six-Day War, it would have been impossible for the Israeli military to realistically countenance the idea of occupying Cairo and Damascus, for example. It's also notable that Israeli military thinkers developed a preference for fighting short, sharp wars, preferably on someone else's territory. Again, both because the resources of the state were always going to be limited, and out of a desire to move the fighting at least some distance away from Israel's population and industrial centres. But at the same time, Israeli history often features a string of individuals and organisations pressuring for some sort of normalisation, permanent peace, with at least most of their state neighbours. With the argument here basically being, while Israel could never afford to lose a war, it could also never decisively and permanently win one. As a Rand paper in 1981 put it, quote, a single defeat may destroy the state, a single Israeli military victory cannot settle the conflict, Israel may face a future of endless war, end quote. These historical experiences and strategic realities shape what we know of Israeli defence doctrine. We've seen through my videos on countries like France, Japan and Korea, that nations tend to build a lot of their understanding of their strategic environment and basic principles into their defence doctrine. And looking at, for example, an Israeli doctrinal document from 2015, by the then Chief of the General Staff of the IDF, it does share some of those same basic characteristics. It sets out five principles of Israeli national security doctrine. These are that Israel should rely on a defensive security strategy based on assuring Israel's existence and creating effective deterrence, but that defensive strategy should be supported by an offensive military concept, built on the basic assumption that, quote, the enemy cannot be defeated through a defensive posture, therefore it is necessary to use force in an offensive posture to achieve clear-cut military results, end quote. The other principles include maintaining Israel's relative military advantage, engaging in strategic international cooperation, particularly with the United States, and also strengthening what Israel describes as its regional status and relationships with regional powers. Israeli commentators will sometimes refer to countries like Jordan or Egypt as partners or allies. And before the events of the last week or so, Israel and Saudi Arabia seemed close to diplomatic normalisation. And a major question for Israeli defence policy now is no matter how the military situation evolves in the coming days and weeks, what effect might this conflict have on that normalisation process? 
One imagines the most likely answer is nothing good. There are also four more military aspects to Israeli doctrine and the way the IDF should be constructed and deployed. These four pillars are the ability to deter threats, to detect and have early warning of opposing capabilities and intentions, to have defensive and protective capabilities, things like the Iron Dome system, and then finally, if necessary, the ability to seek a military decision. Often, it might be observed by mobilizing Israel's reserves and seeking to fight short, sharp, but potentially very intense military campaigns. Which brings us to the structure and design of the Israeli Defense Forces today, and the way they have been built up to meet those dual threats, namely the ability to deter and, if necessary, fight and win conventional state-on-state conflicts on one hand, while countering long-term, asymmetric, low-intensity threats as well. Now, given just how different those missions are, designing a military that can do both might be a bit of a tall order, but let's see how Israel tries to do it. As in most nations, the Israeli ground forces are the largest component. During peacetime, they have a standing strength of about 125,000, of whom maybe 100,000 will be conscripts. If you're looking for a size comparison that makes them about the same size as the French army, despite the fact that France has, well, just a mild edge in population numbers. So far as heavy equipment goes, it is more artillery and armour dense than many European comparators, but proportionally much less firepower intensive than something like the South Korean army. Under ordinary conditions, it's reported the Israelis would be operating about 400 main battle tanks, 1,200 APCs, about 280 self-propelled guns and MLRS systems. As always, those are military balance 2022 figures. Within the overall force, there's a significant focus on mobility, with the force including a full-time paratrooper brigade and three armoured brigades. In personnel terms, the Israeli Air Force is much smaller, about 34,000 personnel. But the Israelis have historically looked to the Air Force to deliver decisive impacts in many conflicts, which means the Air Force tends to be a focus area of tremendous investment, and also that Israel will generally lobby very heavily to prevent nations selling any equipment into the region that would threaten the IAF's overall technical and qualitative advantage. The core of the IAF's strength is its multi-role fighters. The flagships of the fighter force are no doubt Israel's F-35s. In 2022, the Israelis had around 30 of the fifth-generation aircraft, and that number is steadily increasing towards a final target of 75. While more than half of the overall fleet is made up of various F-16 models, with the balance being various F-15s. A note here is that even though Israel operates multi-role fighters, not long-range or strategic bombers, it does have experience in long-range strike. The Air Force has about 10 aircraft for mid-air refueling, and in 1981, the Israelis were able to fly a bombing mission against an unfinished Iraqi nuclear reactor 17 kilometers southeast of Baghdad. The attack was widely condemned at the time by the international community, but it did demonstrate the considerable reach of Israel's American-built fighters. Another note is that even though the Israeli Air Force might be smaller than some international comparators, often you would expect them to fly out of air bases very close to their intended area of operation. That might mean fewer flight and maintenance hours spent getting to and from a target, and that Israeli aircraft might be able to fly more strike sorties in a given day than, for example, US aircraft in the Pacific might during a Pacific War scenario. Along with this fixed wing component, the Israeli Air Force is also responsible for operating just north of 40 AH-64 attack helicopters and providing the foundation of the nation's air defence. Perhaps understandably, the Israeli Navy is the smallest of the three forces. The IDF isn't really configured for long-distance power projection, and so the Navy design reflects that. Perhaps the most sensitive and strategically significant part of the Navy is the submarine force. In 2022, Israel was operating five German-built diesel-electric submarines of the Dolphin and Dolphin II class. The oldest, the original Dolphin, had been commissioned in 1999, while the newest, INS Rahav, was commissioned in 2016, with an even newer version, INS Drakon, launching from its German shipyard in August 2023. That last one hasn't officially been commissioned into the fleet yet, so for now, we'll call the total strength five submarines. As for principal surface combatants, the big cruisers and destroyers of the world, um, Israel doesn't have any. Unlike nations like the USA or UK, Israel doesn't really have a strategic interest in sending its navy to operate at long distance in places like the Indian Ocean or the Pacific. That's not really where the identified threats to Israeli security are located, and neither are known as being Hamas strongholds. And so Israel mostly makes do with a fleet of smaller patrol and coastal combatants intended for operation in the Mediterranean. One thing to note, however, is that when you're talking about some of these smaller Israeli ships, is that the amount of ordnance on board doesn't always align with the total displacement. Here you have the INS Magen up top, compared to the German corvette Magdeburg down bottom. As you can see, the warships look plenty alike, they displace about the same amount, between 1800 and 1900 tons, 
And indeed, the warships are actually reasonably closely related, and Magen was built in a German shipyard. But the German and Israeli navies have different missions, different priorities. The Israelis seem to want warships that can make a radar operator's job easier by simply removing all local tracks in record time, while the German navy sometimes seems to have mixed feelings about its warships doing warship things, like firing weapons. And so these two, in some ways very similar warships, have very different armament loadouts. The German ship mounts four anti-ship missiles, the German-built Israeli ship mounts 16. The German ship has 42 rolling airframe missiles for close-in defence, while the Israeli one has both 40 VLS cells for basically Iron Dome interceptor missiles, and 32 cells for the Barak-8 surface-to-air missile. The Israeli version has torpedo tubes, the German version does not. Although it does, unlike its Israeli cousin, have the ability to act as a mine layer. Now obviously there are always going to be trade-offs packing that many missiles onto a platform that size. But it does serve as something of a reminder that when it comes to warships at least, size isn't everything. These sort of conventional measures of military power, submarines, warships, tanks and artillery, are also in Israel supported by critical but often invisible enablers. Israel, for example, has some of its own military communication and surveillance satellites, with the most recent, I believe, being Ofek-13 that was launched from Palmakim in March. These are the kind of assets that might be easily forgotten if you're trying just to total up a nation's combat power. But having at least some satellites in these categories of your own reduces your reliance both on the civilian market and also potentially on your allies. Now, so far, I've mostly talked about the full-time components of the IDF. Those active service components made up of men and women, conscript and volunteer, whose job it is to wear uniform on a full-time basis. But the IDF is also a mobilisation-based force, albeit one with a very distinctive design that reflects some of the complexities of Israel's strategic situation. If you want to understand what I mean, it helps to compare the IDF to other conscription-based home defence type militaries. Examples we've talked about on the channel before might be nations like Finland or the Republic of Korea, and another one we'll get to someday is the Republic of Singapore. On the surface, these are all national service-based mobilisation armies, but they're not without their differences, with particular differences being in how long conscripts serve, the size of the peacetime army, and the ratio between an army's total wartime mobilised strength and its peacetime strength. At one extreme, you have the Finnish army. The Finnish army's cadre of permanent professionals is tiny, and during peacetime their focus is pretty singular. They train a new intake of nearly 20,000 conscripts every year, provide refresher training for thousands more, and maintain the basic structure of the military so it's there in the event of a mobilisation. But Finland enjoys a degree of strategic depth, Helsinki isn't exactly on the Russian border. The army there also doesn't face many threats during peacetime and so it can afford to take a calculated risk and rely on its ability to mobilise in the event of a war. For the Republic of Korea, with its capital within artillery range of the north, or the literal city-state of Singapore, that depth arguably just doesn't exist. And so there has to be a greater emphasis not just on training reservists, but maintaining a permanent degree of peacetime military readiness and deterrence. For the IDF, all those concerns apply, along with the constant demands of low-intensity warfare or security operations. This is part of the reason why the IDF has a comparatively large standing force relative to its population size, and why unlike some other militaries, conscripts are actually expected to do combat duty, not just train and then pass into the reserves. In part that's possible because, as we'll discuss later, Israeli conscripts serve much longer terms than, for example, Russian or Finnish conscripts. That gives them longer to learn critical military skills and then become useful in operational deployments. The intention behind Israeli force design seems to be that most threats can be dealt with by the standing force without having to call out the reserve component. And recent reforms seem to have focused on this component of the force and in that direction. 2020, for example, introduced the so-called Momentum Plan to reform the Israeli military. That plan, along with the so-called Decisive Victory concept, basically set out the vision of using professional, mobile forces supported by a lot of firepower and ISR capability, to map out and then understand the disposition of forces like Hamas, and then to rapidly destroy them using speed and precision firepower. One illustration of these new concepts was the so-called Ghost Unit, which I saw described by one commentator as a battalion-sized all-arms force with the firepower of a division. Now, for various reasons, including the political and economic, the IDF has not as a whole been transformed to reflect these ideas. But the concept seems to have been aimed at giving the IDF a ground force capable of deterring or retaliating against asymmetric and often rocket-based threats. 
That sort of capability to aggressively respond to peacetime threats was meant to be married with additional defensive technology. Of these, Iron Dome is perhaps the most famous. This is Israel's system of interceptor missiles designed to shoot down incoming rockets that are projected to land in populated areas. It was never meant to be able to handle all-out saturation attacks, but for the sort of small, irregular attacks you might see during whatever passes for peacetime in the Middle East, the system generally proved effective. And indeed, some commentators have hypothesized that the momentum reforms may have reflected concern within the Israeli military establishment that the whole thing was becoming too defensively focused, that Israel was relying too heavily on things like Iron Dome, walls and fixed defenses, and in so doing, perhaps losing some of its historical offensive edge. A question now is how recent events might shape Israeli military thinking going forward, and what that might mean for the future shape of the IDF. But as it is, that's the broad structure of the IDF as it existed a month ago. An active duty force meant to be able to deal with your regular everyday brand of lethal threat, and then a mobilised force that could be called up rapidly if the proverbial shit ever hit the proverbial fan. And given that it's hopefully uncontroversial to say that we are now well and truly past that point at time of recording, I think it's worth talking about the IDF as we'll be seeing it now, fully mobilised and ready for large-scale operations. The basis of Israel's mobilisation system is conscription and reserve service. Unless they have a valid exemption, Israeli men should expect to serve more than two and a half years in the army. And almost uniquely among national militaries, the Israelis also conscript women. They're eligible for the vast majority of roles in the IDF and serve two years of conscript service. That number should also be regarded as a soft minimum, because conscripts, either men or women who choose to go into particularly technical fields, for example, might be expected to serve longer. The induction of women has long been a critical mechanism to allow Israel, with its relatively small population, to build up a very significant mobilisation pool. Because, as it turns out, when you de-exempt roughly 50% of the population from anything, well, suddenly you have a lot more candidates to work with. The result is that while in 2022 about 11% of the UK's regular forces were female, for example, in Israel that number was more than three times higher. At the end of their term of service, Israelis pass into the reserve, enlisted personnel until age 40, officers until age 45. The reserve pool is broadly split into so-called active reservists who've completed a certain amount of refresher training within the last three years, and the rest of the mobilisation pool who haven't gone through refresher training but are still liable to be called up in case of a major emergency. In common with some other, but by no means all other, mobilisation systems, Israeli reservists tend to maintain a pretty close relationship with a single unit as opposed to just passing into a general pool. And we'll see one example of how that can work in just a moment. Now, as you might expect, given that whole lack of strategic depth problem, the Israeli mobilization system isn't really designed to go slowly. Israel's small size makes rapidly generating reserve units very important, but it also makes it possible. Reservists often won't live that far from their base, and often you'll see reservists who are called up relying on all sorts of informal and private means of transportation to get to their units quickly. In many countries, drivers would probably hesitate to pick up hitchhikers carrying automatic weapons. In Israel, however, you'll have plenty of reports of that happening. If you follow my channel, you're probably pretty familiar with the war in Ukraine, so I might use that for some quick comparisons. Before the Ukrainian counteroffensive, a lot of focus was placed on NATO training efforts. They, in 2022 and 2023, allowed Ukraine to generate nine new so-called NATO-trained brigades. Through the combined efforts, it must be said, of the United States, European NATO members, and even some non-NATO members like Australia. By contrast, the Israeli mobilization system is meant to be able to generate nine armored brigades, eight mechanized infantry brigades, four parachute, one mountain, five artillery, and a variety of logistical, territorial support and headquarters units. Heck, Russia's partial mobilization announcement in 2022 was for 300,000 men to be called up. That process took months, and according to Sergei Shoigu, the Russians have been able to sign up and induct approximately 335,000 additional personnel over the entirety of 2023. Israel, with a population around 15 times smaller, says they've called up more than 300,000 reservists in less than a week. And in some cases, we've even seen Israeli reservists reporting for duty before receiving their call-up, which, in the race to rapidly mobilise units, might save valuable hours whereas some forces might use reservists as a general pool to replace losses in the event of a major war, Israel mostly uses them to generate additional units and bulk out its force for major operations. A good example here might be how the Israeli paratrooper units change during mobilization. During peacetime, Israel has one paratrooper brigade, the 35th, 
They spend their time doing paratrooper things and acting as light infantry. But personnel who finish doing their time in the 35th have obviously learnt how to be paratroopers, and so for their reserve service period will tend to pass into a reservist paratrooper brigade. Units like the 55th or the 551st. Then, in the event of a mobilisation like we've seen now, those reserve brigades will be generated. Those ex-paratroopers will become active paratroopers. And on top of all these brigades, a divisional headquarters for the 98th Paratrooper Division will be activated. Meaning that in a period of mobilisation, years of preparation and investment give Israel the ability to turn a paratrooper brigade into a paratrooper division, overwhelmingly staffed by veterans with at least some connection to the unit. It could be argued that that model has potential advantages, like preserving unit cohesion or critical skills, so that in an emergency, reservists aren't familiarising to new roles or entirely new commanders or units. Some of them, for example, may have put on a little weight around the middle in the interim, but they all probably remember how to pack a chute. Now, this model does have the advantage of generating new combat-capable units relatively quickly, but as the war in Ukraine has shown, you can only really generate new combat-capable units if you have the equipment on hand for them. And so on paper, the IDF maintains significant stocks of reserved equipment. For every tank in active service, there's approximately two in reserve. All of Israel's towed artillery is in storage. The number of reported reserved APCs crosses 5,000, which by itself would be enough to replace every visually confirmed Russian IFV and APC loss in Ukraine to date. And you have to imagine equipment stored in the dry conditions of the Israeli desert is probably going to fare better all else being equal in the long term than equipment stored somewhere like the Siberian tundra. The important thing to stress here, though, is that reserved equipment and active equipment is not usually created equal. We tend to think of the IDF as a very modern, well-equipped force. And for most of the active duty component, that might be very true. An active unit, for example, might use the Namer as its APC. That absolute monster of a vehicle, built off the Merkaba tank chassis, is quite possibly the best protected APC in the world which I guess is what you expect when you take one of the most heavily armoured tanks in the world, add even more armour, and turn it into an APC. But if you start digging deeply into that pile of 5,000 reserve vehicles, you're not going to find Namer. You're going to find a dizzying array of vehicles, including M113s, 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 and some adapted versions of the M113. Now, of course, the difference isn't quite as great in all categories, the gap between a Merkava 4 and a Merkava 3 main battle tank, for example, isn't as wide as an M113 to that thing. But when talking about the Israeli mobilisation system, it helps to remember that there's sometimes a bit of a touch of the Russian maxim about the whole thing. Fully mobilised, the IDF has a large modern army. But the large part isn't always modern, and the modern part isn't always large. There is also another major cost, another drawback, of the Israeli model of mobilisation. Namely, the fact that the very act of mobilisation is politically and economically costly. Reservists aren't clones that you keep in some hibernation tube until you're ready to activate them. They're regular people who usually will have regular jobs. Israel has a relatively wealthy, developed economy with a comparatively low unemployment rate. From memory, somewhere between 3 and 4%. So the odds are, when you send out the call-out notices, most of them are not sitting at home playing Starfield or watching Netflix. They're likely working, and your specialist personnel are likely working specialist jobs in the civilian economy. For an example, think back to our video on medical care in Ukraine and the process of mobilising surgeons and medical personnel. This means two things. When you're talking about the Israeli mobilisation process, you might be talking about calling up anywhere between 300, 400, or 500,000 people. Potentially 3, 4, or 5% of the overall population of just north of 9 million. And when you're talking about pulling that many people out of their civilian roles suddenly, that's going to get very expensive for the economy relatively quickly. And secondly, if you do that without having a very good reason for doing so, then some people might start to get a little annoyed that they are now chewing sand in the Negev rather than working in an air-conditioned office. That means the decision to mobilise is a major one, and realistically, there's only so long a mobilisation can be maintained. Remember, adjusted for population, mobilising 5% of the population would mean putting something like 17 million Americans into uniform. And so if an emergency does merit mobilisation, there is every incentive to then deal with that emergency quickly and decisively, so that all those reservists can happily return to the utopic existence of the daily grind and work emails. A final note here is that the disruption caused by those mobilisations also emphasises the need for a reasonably sized active force because otherwise a significantly powerful opponent could eventually exploit the system to just wear you down. 
consider the following scenario, which isn't exactly without historical precedent. Your opponent rushes all their troops to the border and postures for an invasion. You don't want to be invaded, so you mobilise to receive them. Then they carry out a masterful military move of just not invading you. Maybe they send their troops home, causing you to do the same. And then a couple of weeks later, guess what? They move all their troops to the border and posture for an invasion again. So what do you do? Do you take the risk and potentially get invaded unprepared? Or do you disrupt society again and call everyone up again? It's a problem that emphasises why countries like Israel or South Korea can't just rely on an entirely reservist-based model. There's always going to be some degree of military threat and potential for crisis. And you can't afford to be calling Dory from accounting up every six weeks just in case things go hot. So if you think about this in terms of escalation levels, we've now seen the IDF has at least two. There's an active force that can deter with or respond to low intensity or regular threats, and then a mobilised force more than half a million strong that can deter or turn up to deal with significantly greater threats. Some nations, however, also maintain a third level of deterrence, one provided by the possession of nuclear weapons or other weapons of mass destruction, and with them the ability to flip the proverbial chessboard of human civilization if they're ever facing down a game over screen. There are various categories of nuclear powers around the world. There are those that are allowed to possess nuclear weapons under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and declare that they have them. That's the United States, United Kingdom, France, Russia, and the People's Republic of China. Then there are countries that haven't signed the NPT, but nonetheless own up to having nuclear weapons. India, Pakistan, and North Korea fit into that category. Then there are the vast majority of countries around the world who declare openly they do not have nuclear weapons. Then there's a special category, which basically consists only of Israel, because Israel is not an NPT signatory, and its response to the basic question of do you have nuclear weapons, at least officially, basically boils down to maybe, which generally speaking is not something you'd think the leadership of a country would be at all uncertain about. This is commonly described as a policy of nuclear ambiguity where the Israeli government never says it does have nukes, because that can have serious diplomatic and political ramifications, but they also never say they don't have nukes either. As one American Congressional Research Service report put it, quote, the United States has countenanced Israel's nuclear ambiguity since 1969, when the Israeli Prime Minister and US President Richard Nixon reportedly reached an accord whereby both sides agreed never to acknowledge Israel's nuclear arsenal in public, quote. So, to talk a little bit more about this nuclear program, which may or may not exist, wink wink, it's generally understood that Israel built a nuclear reactor complex in the Negev Desert with French assistance during the early Cold War. A number of sources broadly agree that Israel probably had a degree of nuclear capability by the time of the 1967 war. The Negev Nuclear Research Center likely continues to be the center of this maybe, maybe not Israeli program, and open source estimates for Israel's potential nuclear arsenal range from 80 or 90 warheads on the low end up to several hundred on the high end. Now often one of the more expensive parts of a nuclear program isn't the warheads themselves but rather the delivery systems. So let's talk about all of Israel's potential delivery system for all of its potential nuclear weapons. And here, despite its small size, it's broadly believed that Israel might have a fully functional nuclear triad. For example, many public estimates suggest that Israel possesses an intermediate range ballistic missile, the Jerichos. But whereas Russia will flash its nuclear weapons on state TV every fortnight and North Korea rolls them out for parades, the general global public doesn't get to see any Jericho missiles. What we do get to see is the Shavit launch vehicle, capable of lifting satellites into Earth orbit. And if you can lift hundreds of kilos to low Earth orbit, it's not that much more difficult to make sure they come back from low Earth orbit. Air-delivered weapons are relatively simple. There's a reason the Americans started with this in the Second World War. Meanwhile, in terms of survival second strike, it's theorised that Israel's Dolphin-class submarines, which are believed to be cruise missile capable, would be able to mount nuclear warheads. If true, that suggests that Israel is willing to invest in order to have the ability to launch a nuclear strike, even if all of Israel's territory has been overrun. It also potentially reflects a very different approach to nuclear deterrence and nuclear signalling. Many nations set their nuclear doctrine around being as clear and unambiguous as possible. The People's Republic of China, for example, maintains a no-nuclear-first-use stance. Basically, they say they won't nuke you unless you nuke them first. Other countries are also very clear, but in the other direction. As our episode on France discussed, the French say they absolutely will nuke you. But they'll probably nuke you just a little bit at first using the ASMPA, essentially as a warning shot to give you a chance to de-escalate 
negotiate and avoid them nuking you for real and in so doing call a new game on your entire civilization. But Israel doesn't set out a clear public line for nuclear weapon use because it doesn't even admit the weapons exist. That might make the offensive use of nuclear saber rattling or threats a little more difficult. It's kind of hard to make explicit nuclear threats if you can't say that you have nuclear weapons and so you have to settle for implicit ones. But on the defensive, it might potentially introduce additional doubt into your opponent's mind. Because when they are calculating escalation, they have no way of confidently knowing where that red line might be. And where nuclear weapons are involved, that's probably a case of solving for X that you do not want to get wrong. So that rounds out the IDF and Israel's military capabilities. But in these videos, I like to cover at least two other elements that are usually critical to a nation's defense strategy. Firstly, a nation's choice of allies and foreign relations. And secondly, the most interesting and engaging element of every defense strategy, the industry and budgets that underpin all of it. These days, we tend to think of the United States as Israel's primary ally, but that very much wasn't always the case. Instead, through much of the 1950s and 60s, one of Israel's most important security partners was France, while the UK and USA would also be significant arms suppliers. The French would supply the Israelis with just about everything. The army got AMX-13 light tanks, the Air Force got the fantastic Mirage fighters, along with other aircraft like the altogether much less fantastic Vulture. And because history may not repeat, but it often rhymes, many of these French aircraft supplied to Israel would, in Israeli service, get a chance to fight the true enemy of any French weapon system, the British. Because in the 1960s and 70s, it was pretty common to see British aircraft like the Hawker Hunter in service with nations like Iraq and Jordan. Because what else are you going to do as a former colonial power, I suppose, other than sell a bunch of weapons into the region? Over time, British systems would become rarer as more and more Soviet systems arrived. But even denied their traditional enemy, the mirages and mistares of the Israeli Air Force continued to fly effectively. That actually ended up creating a problem for the Israelis when France declared an arms embargo on the country in 1969, partly in response to a 1968 Israeli raid into Lebanon, which destroyed 12 parked passenger aircraft. That meant that Israeli industry needed to provide a replacement to the Air Force's mirages and to do it quickly. And so, as the official story goes, Israeli industry came up with these completely indigenous designs to augment and replace the Mirage. Firstly, the IAI Kafir, which is very obviously not a Mirage 5. And then secondly, the Nesher, which is very obviously not a Mirage 5, with an American power plant and a couple of other improvements. Now, the actual story of both aircraft is a little more complicated, but I will add this one historical tidbit. After the Israeli Air Force began retiring those very first not Mirage 5s, Many of them were sold to Argentina. There, they were flown under the name Dagger and used against, you guessed it, the British during the Falklands War. Because even knockoff French weapon systems need to find their way to fight the British somehow. Over time, however, the United States grew into being Israel's primary security partner. The relationship was more rocky and inconsistent than you might assume. With the key US policy driver in the region, unsurprisingly enough for the Cold War, usually being containing Soviet influence more than advancing the interests of any particular country. But that said, the role of the US was at times critical. During the 1973 war, with the Israelis apparently on the back foot and the Soviets beginning a large-scale resupply operation, the Americans decided to counter with Operation Nickelgrass, which was the airlift component of a combined air and sea lift operation to resupply the IDF with everything it needed from ammunition to armoured vehicles. In total, Military Airlift Command moved about 22,000 tonnes of equipment in about a month. The operation almost didn't happen and wasn't without consequence. Most European NATO allies wanted nothing to do with the resupply flights and denied their air bases. But one very critically didn't, Portugal, which gave the Americans the link they needed to fly from the continental United States to their destinations in Israel. OPEC in turn responded with an oil embargo against the United States, but the impact had been made. It's interesting to note that in modern times, the Americans have declared Israel, along with Egypt, to be major non-NATO allies. But at the same time, there's no formal mutual defense treaty between the two countries. The US is not officially required to come to Israel's defense, nor is Israel required to respond to attacks on the US. That actually puts Israel on paper in a very different category to countries like the Philippines, Japan, or Korea. But the US does factor into Israeli security planning. Historically, for example, the United States has been willing to use its veto in the United Nations Security Council to shield Israel from certain resolutions there. While in 2016, a 10-year agreement was reached under which the US provides Israel with foreign military financing of about 3.3 billion US dollars per annum 
as well as half a billion US dollars for missile defence. The key point here is that as with some announced US aid to Ukraine, that $3.3 billion doesn't come in the form of unmarked pallets of cash which you can spend however you wish. Instead, it's more like Washington issuing a gift card for America's defence industrial base. Israel is able to use the funding, but usually to buy weapons or services from the United States. Which, as some might note, means that a lot of the funding recycles back into the American economy, and also that if Israel wants to buy more compatible weapon systems to go along with the ones it purchased using its foreign military aid, well, then it probably needs to buy more American weapon systems, this time using its own money. The US also maintains a very significant pre-positioned stock of military equipment and ammunition inside Israel. These munitions and other systems don't belong to Israel, they remain the property of the United States. But by being there, they give the US the option to respond with military aid to Israel quickly in the event of a crisis. Equipment and munitions don't have to be shipped from the continental United States. Instead, it allows the Americans to basically offer a click and collect service to the IDF. This actually goes to one of the ways in which recent events may impact the war in Ukraine. Because earlier this year, it was reported that America was shipping some munitions from this stockpile in Israel to supply the war in Ukraine. At the time, that seems to have had the nod from the Israelis. But given the IDF is now mobilised and potentially very much heading into large-scale combat operations, one has to wonder whether there'll be more pressure in Washington DC and Tel Aviv to keep these munitions where they are, rather than shipping them to Kyiv. There is of course more to the US-Israel security relationship, but we'll come back to that a little bit more when we talk about current events. Because first we need to talk about one more aspect that underlies Israel's military capabilities. Namely, the defence industrial base that supports and supplies it. There were some efforts to establish domestic arms production on a small scale in Israeli territory even before the Israeli Declaration of Independence. And over time, those efforts would only escalate. The modern state of Israel has faced many arms embargoes or restrictions from foreign powers over the course of its history. And given that Israel's security situation meant that Israeli governments usually didn't see armaments as discretionary goods, a lot of effort went into ramping up domestic manufacturing capability. That said, especially in its early years, Israel didn't have a massive industrial base, and so for the most part it steadily worked its way up the various levels of complexity when it came to weapon systems, starting for the most part with relatively basic goods, things like small arms, while also becoming very adept at salvaging, repairing and upgrading any armoured vehicle they could get their hands on. Because while Israel didn't begin with the industrial capacity to build new tanks from scratch, for example, that didn't stop them finding creative ways to upgun and up armour basically anything. For example, Israel would operate deeply upgraded versions of the American Sherman into the early 1980s. American M48s and M60s got even deeper upgrade treatment, and the last of those weren't pulled from frontline units until the early 2000s. By which point, Israeli industry and the Israeli defence budget could afford to provide all Israeli tank units with domestically built designs. Jump to 2023, and Israel is recognised as having an advanced defence industrial base that's active in global export markets. Those Israeli defence export successes are concentrated in a couple of systems categories, namely missiles, sensors and air defence systems, which, according to CIPRI data over the period 2012 to 2022, accounted for 34, 26 and 17% of Israeli military exports respectively. So if you're looking for an air defence solution, the Israelis will probably sell you something to detect the threat, target it, and then a missile to fire at it. Geopolitically, many of Israel's primary defence customers are nations that generally express a preference against, or have limited access to, significant amounts of US hardware. According to this data, more than a third of all Israeli exports went to India, while Azerbaijan, Vietnam, the United States and the Philippines were all markets of significant importance, with the sales to Azerbaijan being particularly notable in the context of that country's regular clashes with Armenia. The war in Ukraine does seem to have caused some shift in Israeli export patterns, however as European powers in particular look to bulk up or rebuild their MLRS and artillery parks, and have in some cases turned to purchasing Israeli systems like the Pulse MLRS as a result. One notable trend that has continued, however, is that despite producing all of its own tanks and many of its own armoured personnel carriers, Israel isn't a leading exporter of heavily armoured vehicles. There are a lot of elements that go into potentially explaining that trend, but part of the answer may be that the Israeli design process for armoured vehicles is optimised for designing vehicles that operate effectively in Israel. The implication of that is that Israel might not be super well positioned to sell large numbers of armoured vehicles abroad, but do have a domestic industry capable of producing a number of vehicles optimised for their own requirements. 
But it's also important to recognise that partial self-reliance isn't full self-reliance. And that at the end of the day, despite considerable investment, a country of fewer than 10 million people probably can't be a world leader in every system category. And whenever it tries to compete, there are always hard decisions to be made and risks to be taken. In the 1980s, for example, the Israelis were working on developing an aircraft that might have been a competitor to the F-16, the IAI Levy. But the project was ultimately discontinued because it was demanding a significant proportion of the available state funds, and also potentially because the Americans weren't particularly keen on having an F-16 competitor entering the market from a country that they were providing military support to. And so for the most part, Israeli companies have chosen to pick and choose their battles when it comes to system development. And while the army uses large numbers of Israeli-designed and produced systems and platforms, to grossly oversimplify, a lot of the Air Force is American, and a lot of the Navy German. Between 2012 and 2022, 68% of Israel's defence imports came from the United States, 27% from Germany, and 5% from Italy. Of those, about half were aircraft, overwhelmingly from the United States. 18% ships and submarines, overwhelmingly from Germany, with other significant categories being missiles and armoured vehicles. This suggests that while Israel may be self-reliant in some systems categories, it still has a significant reliance on foreign suppliers, particularly when it comes to sustaining air and naval operations. All of which might be causing you to ask a question. How on earth does a nation this size possibly afford all of this? In 2022, CIPRI assessed the Israeli defense budget at about 23.4 billion US dollars. That made military spending about 4.5% of Israeli GDP, down from 5.5% in 2013. On one hand, that's a relatively high percentage of GDP expenditure. But on the other, you could argue Israel, especially compared to certain other forces, seems to maintain a lot of personnel, equipment, and capability relative to that available budget. But before you national leaders out there start sending out conscription notices to try and duplicate some of that apparent cost efficiency, remember there are some caveats and opportunity costs a budget like this will never capture. For one, there's just an economic opportunity cost that comes from putting young people through military service as opposed to sending them into the workforce, for example. During the two or more years a young Israeli might spend in uniform, they're not working in the civilian economy, paying taxes and contributing to GDP. The cost to pay them for their service time is visible on the government budget. The foregone revenue from pulling them out of the civilian economy isn't. And the other side of that opportunity cost is for the conscripts themselves. They have less time in the civilian economy to build their skills, their earning capacity, and advance their career goals. And so to make this system work in a democracy, you need broad social support. This is why nations can't just adopt conscription and mobilization as a cheat code for solving their defense economics problems. And it's why domestic debates over, for example, exemptions from conscription might be so threatening to the Israeli system. Because if people don't feel a burden is being equally shared, they may be less willing to bear it. So now we have a little more context. How the IDF came to be, how it fights, how it's organised, and how industry and international policy support it. But whereas when I first started creating this video, many of those questions were either hypothetical or historical, over the last week or so, they have become very real, very painfully real. And so without diving too far into the detail, I want to have a look at some of what has happened so far and what it might tell us about the IDF and the war to come. As far as we can tell, the Hamas-led attacks can be split into two broad components. Saturation rocket attacks on one hand and ground attacks, raids and hostage taking on the other. The rocket attacks involve saturating the Iron Dome defensive system by firing literally thousands of rockets from Gaza against Israeli targets in rapid succession. The ground component involved rapidly pushing multiple teams of fighters into Israeli territory, either through breaches in the wall on foot or using civilian motor vehicles, or in at least one case captured on video, apparently using very unconventional air vehicles. Now, the details are all over the news and we're currently on YouTube here, so I won't be laying out any examples of the horror that followed. It is enough simply to say that in scale, This was the largest single loss of Israeli civilian life due to hostile action in one single day since the founding of the modern Israeli state. Over the days that followed, it seemed that some of the Hamas fighters who made their way into Israel retreated back to the Gaza Strip, reportedly taking a significant number of hostages with them. Others appear to have remained in Israeli territory, where the Israeli military has moved to sweep and secure the infiltrated areas. As at time of recording, Israel has now concentrated significant ground forces facing the Gaza Strip. And we are now almost a week into an Israeli bombing campaign that has reportedly caused significant damage and casualties. 
Meanwhile, the international response to the crisis continues to evolve. Many Western nations appear to have taken the stance of recognising publicly Israel's right to defend itself, while also stressing the importance of protecting civilian lives in Israeli military actions against the Gaza Strip. The US has bulked up its naval presence in the region, both in the eastern Mediterranean and closer to Iran. They've also publicly indicated they'll provide military aid to Israel, so far apparently focused on missile defence. Then there are a range of other relevant actors, including Iran as well as its friends, allies and proxies. Hezbollah have so far fired some rockets from Lebanon, but there hasn't been any larger scale action. While the Russian position, advanced by President Vladimir Putin, is that all of this is really just the result of failed American policy in the Middle East, and that's where the blame should lie. In the coming days and weeks, you'd expect the Israelis to be watching that international response closely, both to assess what the odds of some sort of escalation from Lebanon or Syria might be during any operation against the Gaza Strip, but also to understand the stances of nations like Saudi Arabia that Israel's working towards normalisation with. It's been theorised by some commentators, although it's obviously impossible to prove, that one possible motivation for Hamas' original actions may in fact have been to sabotage, among other things, Israeli-Saudi rapprochement. But for now, that's mostly just speculation, so let's pivot back to some observations that we might be able to make with a little bit more confidence. The first is that there is probably no way around the assessment that this was a catastrophic intelligence failure by Israel's security apparatus. Remember our discussion of doctrine much earlier in this episode, and the importance Israel tends to place in those documents on good intelligence. Israel's strategy has long focused on, and indeed assumed, that it will be able to foresee potential incoming threats. And yet, just over a week ago, it seems like the Israeli military was caught almost completely off guard, and that attackers, in many cases using civilian vehicles, were able to break through or bypass Israeli defences and make their way towards population centres. More than a few commentators have already drawn comparisons to 1973, another case where, quite infamously, the Israelis were caught off guard. That intelligence failure was examined extensively within Israel and abroad, as I imagine this one will be as well. Many Israelis and foreign observers blamed the 73 failure on bad assumptions and processes. As the former director of Mossad, Zvi Zamir, put it, Israel had scorned and underestimated its potential opponents leading to intelligence assessments basically becoming a cross-fertilisation process where everyone agreed with each other, no one rocked the boat, and in so doing, set the stage for disaster. In business, building up a yes-man culture that doesn't welcome dissenting opinions or unwelcome news might just result in suboptimal business performance or everyone telling the boss that his plan to go all in on NFTs in 2024 is absolutely a fantastic idea. But when it comes to national security, the results can obviously be more dire. Another potential issue with Israeli assessments in 73 was identified by American analyst Bruce Riddell. As he put it, quote, Israeli intelligence failed to see a war coming in 1973 because it was wedded to a concept, that the Arabs would not go to war because they would lose, and therefore the danger of war was minimal, end quote. There are a few problems one might observe with that sort of reasoning. Firstly, that your opponent shares your assessment of their strength and yours. And I would argue, as we saw in the Russian invasion of Ukraine, there is no guarantee that a country has an accurate understanding of its own military strength. The second assumption, perhaps even more dangerous, is that your opponent might not be willing to attack you, even if they do expect to lose. To turn back to present events, the probability of Hamas achieving the conventional military destruction of Israel was basically zero. The most probable outcome now seems to be massive Israeli retaliation against Hamas infrastructure in Gaza. And yet some in Hamas clearly decided to go ahead anyway with results we've all been forced to witness over the past week. Observation 2 is a confirmation of the challenges of missile defence and the shot exchange problem. In many ways, Israel as a country represents the perfect scenario for a missile defence system, mostly because it's relatively compact and as a result, relatively few systems can cover a large percentage of the population. It faced off against a relatively technologically non-sophisticated opponent in the form of Hamas, using very low-tech rockets with limited penetration aids. And yet, by firing thousands of cheap rockets in rapid succession, Hamas were able to overwhelm the Iron Dome system. Even with the disparity of resources involved, it's simply too difficult to build a missile defence system with so much capacity that it can handle any given saturation attack. There can only ever be so many interceptor missiles on the ready rack. And even if the ready supply is sufficient, there's always the problem that interceptors will cost considerably more than the rockets they're shooting down. Now, that doesn't mean that Iron Dome hasn't had a significant impact and hasn't saved lives. 
But what it does do is highlight some of the underlying defence economic problems of missile defence, especially as we move into an era where cheap drones are joining rockets as an affordable long-range attack option, which leads to a potentially terrifying observation to do with those drones. We have seen drone warfare in Ukraine evolve at a frenetic pace. At some point, I'll do a video on the speed of that evolution, and I promise you, it will be terrifying. But so far, a lot of the innovations we've seen in Ukraine have only been seen in Ukraine. In Israel, however, we've got some small signs that may be beginning to change. We have seen, for example, video footage of a drone being used to drop an anti-tank weapon against a Merkava 4 main battle tank, apparently knocking it out. This is not some banged-up T-55 pulled out of a Siberian storage yard. This is a heavily protected, relatively modern main battle tank with an active protection system. But that system clearly wasn't configured to deal with this sort of threat, and it highlights for me the danger that some of the expertise that's been developed in Ukraine will start to leak out to other theatres as well. And if you're wondering whether governments and forces around the world are ready for that sort of proliferation, well, I'll just leave that one to the audience for now. So with those super comforting observations in place, I thought the best way to close out might be with some suggestions as to what might now happen next. As always, understand there's only so much we as observers can see from the outside looking in, but that doesn't stop us making some reasoned predictions and observations based on the information in front of us. At time of recording, a lot of things seem to point towards an Israeli ground offensive into Gaza being imminent. Given what we've seen from Israeli military unit movements and mobilization, it's likely Israeli forces are either already at the stage or will soon be at the stage where they have all the systems and capability in place to launch significant movements into Gaza should they choose to do so. The peacetime IDF might lack the manpower necessary to launch significant operations into Gaza while also securing Israel's other borders, but the IDF of mid-October is a mobilised one. We're now talking about a force that might have as many uniformed personnel as the US regular army, concentrated along what is, compared to Ukraine, a tiny geographical frontage. Add to that the Israeli request for potentially a million Gazan civilians to evacuate parts of the Gaza Strip, and it's probably safe to assume the odds of something significant happening are pretty high. What I do want to stress, though, is just what that sort of operation would mean. Whether we're talking about small raids, ongoing air and artillery strikes, or a more significant ground operation. Gaza is an incredibly densely populated place. You are talking about 2 million people living in an area of roughly 365 square kilometres. So in terms of size and density, this isn't Bakhmut or Avdivka in Ukraine. This is closer to Queens in New York City, an area with 2.4 million people living in 280 square kilometres. It's an area where Hamas is known to have significant tunnel systems, so many potential Israeli targets are going to be buried underneath other structures. At the same time, border crossings to Egypt and Israel are very tightly controlled, making for a very difficult supply and evacuation situation for the population in the Strip, which is where we finally start to come full circle on all our observations about the IDF's capabilities. In Gaza, you're talking about fighting in a densely populated, often urban environment. Historically, urban fighting is about as ugly as fighting can get. If the IDF decides to deploy additional firepower in order to enable those sort of operations, well, as we've seen, they have the ground and air-based fires to do it. But in an environment like Gaza, any deployment of heavy firepower is always going to run the significant risk of major loss of civilian life and destruction of civilian infrastructure. So if the IDF chooses to apply enough force and firepower to realistically destroy Hamas military infrastructure in the Gaza Strip, I think it's more than likely that, that will come at a significant cost to the wider Gazan population. But recent statements by Israeli political figures, including Prime Minister Netanyahu, do seem to suggest that a larger-scale ground operation is coming. In zooming out here, there's a difficult question to ask regarding who or which groups lose and who, if anyone, profits out of the present situation. The list of those who have lost significantly is already pretty long. Civilians in both Israel and Gaza probably top that list. The Israeli state, meanwhile, has suffered an embarrassing intelligence failure and may yet see major strategic initiatives like normalisation with Saudi Arabia scuppered by the current events. Meanwhile, Hamas will now likely find its infrastructure and personnel being aggressively targeted by a full range of Israeli military capabilities. As for other regional actors like Saudi Arabia or Iran, the results are still very much unclear. That will depend a lot on how this all plays out and how it shapes the balance of diplomacy and power in the region going forward. But with the list of losers already very long, there is one political figure who could be tentatively nominated as a potential beneficiary of the last week's events, namely the Russian president himself, 
Vladimir Putin. With the situation now significantly escalated, it's possible that American attention and American aid may be diverted to Israel at the expense of Ukraine. Russia benefits from potential upward pressure on oil prices and anything that diverts Western attention, resources or political will away from the fight in Ukraine. A lot obviously now hinges on how this war plays out, but as the people of the region take stock of this unfolding tragedy, it may be that one of its few beneficiaries is the man in Moscow. In conclusion, the design of the IDF reflects Israel's perception of its strategic position and its past wartime experiences. The force appears to have been designed to provide deterrence and respond to low-intensity threats during peacetime, along with the ability to rapidly mobilise to fight and win short, sharp wars. The Israeli defence industrial base is configured to support that sort of military. And while the Israeli Air Force and Israeli Navy in particular are still very much reliant on foreign platforms, Israel is capable of producing many of the basics itself, from armoured vehicles to artillery ammunition to munitions like bombs and missiles. Recent days have seen Israel call up those mobilisation reserves and posture a lot of those capabilities towards the Gaza Strip. As for how that situation will now evolve in the coming days, as always, only time will tell. Okay, and now I will offer a quick channel update to close out. I had been preparing to do a video on the Israeli Defence Forces for some time. I had it tentatively penciled in for a December release. And when the headlines of the last week began to break, I wasn't sure originally whether I should try and bring the release date forward to try and provide some additional context to people who are now following the crisis. In the end, I put that decision to the patrons and the wider audience. And in the end, the advice they gave was pretty clearly, go ahead. I've always had great respect for my patrons and my subscriber base, and I hope all of you listening are happy with the decision that was made. I'd like to make clear that I genuinely wish the best for all of those families who've been impacted by these recent events. No civilian anywhere should have to live in fear or terror. In the coming days and weeks, I'll try and find some way to help those affected in the same way I've done with the war in Ukraine. But for now, I'll just close out with my thanks to all of you who continue to support and engage with the channel. And to those of you in Israel or Gaza, please stay safe.